Good afternoon. My name is Keith Sullivan. I'm the chairman of the Tewksbury School Committee, and I'd like to call to order our August 6, 2020 special school committee meeting at 3.01 p.m. Our August 6 school committee meeting is being held virtual via WebEx, although the school committee and administration are participating together from a classroom at Tewksbury Memorial High School in accordance with the CDC uh, proper distancing guidelines that include sitting more than six feet apart. It was originally our plan to host both yesterday's workshop and today's special meeting in person in accordance with DESE's guidelines, but unfortunately the Attorney General's office ruled that because public indoor gatherings are still considered meetings, we would have been limited to 25 people to be able to attend the meeting in person and to the public. Additionally, we ask that you understand special exemptions were made by the Commonwealth to allow for both annual town election and annual town meeting. That was not the case for this meeting today. This meeting is a public meeting being televised and recorded and the public can view this meeting live through television cable channels, Comcast channel 22, Verizon channel 34, or at www.youtube.com slash Tewksbury TV. If the public wishes to participate, you can do so by calling 978-771-0819. And that number should be on the screen. Please be advised, we will have our public input session momentarily, so please get ready to call if you want to participate. Before we do advance on the agenda, I would once again like to thank all of our parents, students, teachers, staff members, the reopening task force, and the district leadership team for all of their input, insight, and understanding as we all try to work together towards a solution that we all feel is best in the best interest of all our students, all our staff, and all our families. I also want to reassure the public, everyone in this room today, that's what we believe is in the best interest of not only our schools, our students, and our staff at heart, but also the community at large. This is important because this decision will impact student academics and outcomes, impact our families and staff in the town as well. I would respectfully request that you remain mindful of that and realize that a lot of the detailed work still lies ahead. The School Committee Reopening Task Force and District Leadership Team is fully committed to continue the diligent work and the responsible work with all of our stakeholders and employee groups to create what we believe will be a safe learning environment for all our students, families, and staff, and for all the three models, because most likely they will all probably be needed this year. Thank you. Order. Before we get to the public uh, comments, I would uh, like to ask uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, we have an agenda item number number five. Uh, it's a brief housekeeping and clarifying issue. So, if you want to start uh, the public comment section, please call in. There is about a 25 second, 30 second delay. I will ask if you're watching on YouTube, from which I understand was a much better broadcast. Um, Yesterday, please understand there's a delay, and if you do call in, we do please ask you to um, turn your TV down, and please give uh, Brian your name and your address for the record. Um, so that being said, do I have a motion uh, from the committee to move number five, the school calendar vote, up prior to the public comments? So move, Mr. Chairman. Second. I have a motion and a second to move the school calendar vote for the first day for students. Only for students. Mr. Stadman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Cutlass? Aye. Mrs. Demos? Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. That's a unanimous vote. I'd like to now turn the floor over to Superintendent Malone for a brief update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a reminder on that uh, uh, school calendar vote has to do with uh, first day for students which uh, under the new guidelines put out by DESC, uh, student school year went from 180 school days to 170. 
those 10 days remain on the calendar for the staff as professional development opportunities for them. But with those uh, 10 days working by the state, the first day for students would be uh, September 16th. They would total up 170 school days at the end of the school year. Great. So I'd like to open it up to my colleagues. Any questions? Okay. And just for clarity, once again, just to reiterate for the public, this is students only. Um, this was driven by the 10 days. Um, so uh, what is the pleasure of the board at this time? I make a motion that the uh, first day of school for students be Wednesday, September 16th, 2012. Second that. I have a motion and a second to make the first day of school for students Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. Mr. Cutlass, how do you vote? Aye. Ms. Demos, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wilson, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Stadman, how do you vote? Aye. Kia votes aye as well. That's a unanimous vote. Um, regardless of the model that's chosen, students will start their academic uh, career this year uh, for the 2020-2021 on Wednesday, September 16th. Thank you very much. Moving on to the public comments section. Brian, do we have any uh, callers yet? We have no callers, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, I would just like to maybe offer up, uh, I'll reach out to my colleagues. I'm not wanting to limit anyone's ability to say anything. I think uh, maybe we should put a time frame on and get them in some other business. Mr. Salmon, anything? Uh, do you uh, recommend a certain amount of time limit? I think that works. If people aren't calling in, they we should get that. Yeah, I'm noting what do we have? 308. Okay, we'll say about 312. Uh, in the in the interim, and uh sake of moving things along, I think we will turn it over to Superintendent Malone, and maybe he can talk about the process, uh, about how we got here a little bit. And once we reach that 312 threshold, we can uh, continue that discussion and have our deliberations. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just once again, uh, thank you to everyone who's been involved in this process, uh, particularly the school committee members here tonight, uh, the reopening task force, the leadership team. A huge thank you to everybody involved. And once again, uh, we did not anticipate we would be in a situation where we'd be having a school committee to make a final decision on what the reopening plan was. As we go back to the process, uh, when we were working as early as May to look at how we were going to reopen in August, uh, that determination was clearly going to be done by uh, Department of Development and Secondary Education. And they would inform us of that decision. Our planning at that time was based on uh, what we would anticipate those models to look like by, by DSE and to plan for each one. At that time, the two models to look at were all students returning to school with appropriate safety precautions and remote learning. We also anticipated that uh, even as far back as May, that we may have students start the year in remote learning for specific medical reasons or other reasons of that nature. So we continue planning on both of those models fairly continuously uh, throughout May and June. Uh, by mid-July, we were informed that as I messaged out to parents and staff in my July 23rd letter, uh, the situation had drastically changed. Where DESE had in fact informed all districts that decision of how they would reopen would now not be made at the state level, but would be made at the local level by school to vote. In addition to that, that fall reopening school guidance initially, initially put out in late July by DBSE required each district to develop three plans, a remote learning plan, 
a hybrid learning pool and a all students returning plan. The hybrid plan was a new development at that time. Uh, we had, at, in, by uh, mid July, had already established a task force prior to that ruling by DPC. Their initial job was to help us implement DE, DESC's decision, and their mission changed fairly quickly to actually garner information and form a school committee uh, of the information they gathered and the research they had done and the thought process that task force had gone through to hopefully inform the school committee enough that they would be in a position to make a decision, which is why we are here today. Uh, I again want to thank all those task force members from across the community, parents, teachers, custodian, uh, secretaries, nurses, uh, a, a complete uh, conglomerate of stakeholders from throughout the community that really rolled their sleeves up and did a great deal of work, primarily looking at all the DESC guidance, and there was quite an extensive amount of that. And they were also supplied uh, some information from the Tuxbury Teachers Association to consider. And they were able to look through that information. We took in a great deal of parent feedback, emails, and phone calls leading up to that. Uh, we solicited over the past two weeks some significant increase in parent feedback via email. Uh, we brought those issues to the attention not only of the task force, but we brought them in our presentation yesterday in the workshop to be considered. And it's clear that this is an emotional uh, situation for the community. It's, it's also very clear that we have uh, kind of people who have differing opinions across spectrum of this community. And this is going to be a difficult decision for the school. One of the aspects that we were required to submit on July 31st was a reopening preliminary plan, which we uh, worked on with the district leadership team, submitted through the task force to look at for edits and comments. Part of that process was to also, uh, on that July 31st submittal, uh, inform DESE the exact quote they used, where the district was leaning towards as far as opening for one of the three models. We did a, a preliminary plan for all three models. We discussed it on the task force extensively. Uh, and uh, prior to July 31st, we actually had a vote within the task force to make a determination of where we were leaning based on the information at time uh, of the vote. Uh, that vote uh, came out by task force as 14 members in favor of hybrid, five members in favor of an all in return, and three members in favor of a remote learning to start. The additional parent feedback, the email, uh, phone conversations pretty much supports the surveying we've done in the district, that there is certainly uh, some split beliefs amongst the entire three models, and certainly surveying staff uh, also reflects in that. What we've seen from parent surveying and is backed up by most of the parent feedback we've received is that uh, most of the parents are on this, the end of some semblance of returning students to school, whether that be all in returning or a hybrid model. Uh, the lowest percentage of parents were in relation to starting in a remote only model. When working with our staff members, um, it was almost the opposite. Uh, Finance of staff members felt that remote learning was going to be the best model to start in, in a lesser amount for uh, hybrid. In it. So there's certainly opinions crossing all spectrums of this decision. It's not an easy decision. It's a decision that we're making here on August 6th that will impact student arrival on September 16th. Things could happen after this vote, uh, whether that be coming out of the state from the governor or other issues that may influence this decision moving forward. We don't know that. But it is important, one, that we're required to submit 
as part of our comprehensive reopening plan the school committee vote of which model the school committee feels uh, the district should start in and that will help both the task force the district leadership team teachers parents think and plan forward for that model as an opening model while we consider all new information that comes in whether that's medically based or otherwise and to continue to look at that while we also continue to develop whatever two models we don't actually start with uh, we anticipate there may be a need for all three models to be utilized during the school year so we want to make sure regardless of the vote today that we continue to develop all three models as we move forward part of that uh reopening plenary plan summary was uh we were tasked out with prioritizing all in return of students all students returning for full day of school every day we did some extensive work on that some barriers that we found that we do believe there are avenues that uh they could be uh certainly gotten by those barriers but they may be costly or extensive one was in transportation our ability to transport all students with the new restrictions on how many students we could have on a bus significantly would increase the number of bus runs we would need to take may have an impact on when students would be arriving at school and when they would be arriving at home and likely if we were all in process we would need to hire out additional transportation assets on the uh, transportation services we currently contract so that would require additional services and certainly increase dependability uh, on the budget. Another element that we looked at as a barrier was food service, the ability to serve students uh, lunch during the school day because of the distancing requirements when students uh, pull their masks down to eat and having students six feet apart, not only in the cafeteria, but any other location would have to be, would have to be utilized for eating, whether that be in the classroom or other spaces in the school ensuring students are six feet apart in those locations, ensuring that we had the staffing available food services to deliver those meals to those locations, and ensuring that we had the custodial staff to clean those areas uh, in addition to that. And once we look at serving food outside the cafeteria, it certainly brings up issues such as food allergies, food safety, and other cleanliness issues. So those are, are issues we could certainly tackle, but they would very costly that we have to think about what the impact may be with the budget. I think one of the things we really struggled with the feasibility part is the uh, difference in opinion from parents to teachers on their preferred way to start, uh, with them being kind of on opposite ends. It's very difficult feasibility-wise to think through what the best way to approach that would be. Uh, that's not to say one side is right or one side is wrong. It's just identifying the fact that there is a true discrepancy in where parents believe we should be starting and where teachers believe we should be starting. So that's a hard piece to, to kind of work through, and it's something we're going to have to consider after today's vote how to work with all stakeholders, all groups, to ensure we're doing appropriate planning for whichever model we move forward with, we have appropriate expectations. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that is how we kind of all find ourselves here today, with the opportunity to take a vote on uh, which model of the three, remote learning, hybrid model, or all in returning, that the school committee will determine we will expect to start the school year on September 16th. Great. Thank you, Superintendent Malone. And I'm just gonna check in with Brian one final time. Brian, do we have anyone on the line? We have no callers, Mr. Chairman. Okay. At this time, I would like to move to the reason we're here today, number four, the 2020-2021 school reopening plan. And I'd like to uh, open it up to my colleagues uh, for discussion. I'm going to start on my right with uh, Mr. Stanton. Any comments, concerns, questions that you may have uh, for the district, Mr. Malone, or Mr. Uh, Lee, or colleagues? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
do, I have a uh, couple of questions. What I wanted to know, depending on what model we select today, um, is there room within that decision for us to suggest a month of A with the intention only to be, uh, and obviously not all the way out, you know, maybe six months from now, somewhere else. But, you know, it's, it's um, we just sort of suggesting this is what we believe the best plan is, or because I, I should elaborate a little bit as we look at the hybrid plan. I know that through discussions with the community um, that we've talked about some of the challenges, some of the complexities that go into that plan, and I'm wondering if we had a little bit more time, could we develop a better plan within that hybrid? Um, with two extra weeks, four extra weeks, um, if we started somewhere. I, I it's certainly more an opinion, right? right. And, sure. I, and I think certainly the committee can decide, you know, which, whichever. I don't think we're bound by any of those pieces. The only um, comment I might have on that is I just want to make sure we're clear, the parents, the staff members. Kind of what direction we're going out of today. Um, choose those models to start, which one of those models to start. I think that's realizing that the impact of this pandemic, any other factors that may get in, we have to be ready to pivot from that. One of the issues I think that uh, we've heard out of the is that um, if in, in, in the state, as we were just on a call of commission today, and the state is hopefully coming up with that would tell you whether it's locally or statewide what's needed the level of positive tests, case, uh, amount of tested, and you know, percentages, whatever that metric is, that will guide us to when we should be in one model or not. Um, I think part of this is we are going to be making a decision based on what we know on August 6th. Uh, and we do probably have to be prepared to pivot. That, that changes between now and um, September 16th. I do think that any combination of models or other pieces um, will probably layer the difficulty in implementation. I think without a specific metric of a determination to start in this and change to that, what is the criteria for that decision? And could it change? That would be my concern as superintendent that if without a criteria of change, we would run into the same situation we're in right now where we have people's beliefs and opinions of kind of, I think we have right now is probably a good number of people can't go bring up where we're at right now as far as this pandemic, let alone where we're going to be. Um, my concern would be is that going to uh, create a different type of disruption, much closer to student arrival in decision making. And will that be left up in the I, I, I do, if I can, it's not that you remember the task force vocal on this. I think there's reactive, when we, we're going to have to react to uh, maybe a possible changing situation around us, better or worse. But there's also proactive, and I think we have to write into our plan that we're going to look at not only the situation around us, but the delivery of instruction throughout any implementation. How is it going? We have to survey our parents and students. We're going to need to improve. We've never done this before. So I think no matter what we put out there as our implementation, there has to be moments or um, benchmarks that we're looking to see where are we two, three weeks in. Are we ready to go more, less? Are we doing it well? Um, are students and families responding well to this? Because so there's the reaction to the you know, pandemic, and there's the reality to be putting this for the models we're choosing. I guess my only other question, and you probably can't answer this, uh, but I'll ask it anyways. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering. And obviously, this is our decision. We're going to make it, and that's the right thing for us to do. 
but you had your problems, so you have an opinion about which plan you would like to see more. You're just sort of waiting for the decision to come out. Because you, you two may have different opinions yourselves. If you Brenda may think one thing, Chris may think something else, I don't know. Um, and if it's not something that you want to answer, that's fine. So, so no, it's, it's a great question. I've been asked it before. And, and, and quite frankly, um, I think I can better serve the district if I'm focused on all the three cleans. Um, this is a huge lift. This is nothing like we've seen before or had to deal with. It's emotional for people. And we're going to have to educate students one way or another starting on September 16th. And I do feel that's where my best efforts need to be placed. I can see the pros and cons of each one of these. I talk to hundreds of people. I talk to staff members. That's like, and this is emotional. And I think um, there is the factual, medical, other piece side, which I do think kind of sends it down a somewhat of a clear road that tells you we're in good shape that, to have some level of in-person instruction. I don't think you can deny that. You have the other emotional, other piece that um, is hard. People are having a hard time with it. It, it creates fear. Um, it creates anxiety for people, and that's tough. And I think that's going to happen. To, both of those are going to happen no matter which model we're in. We're going to have to manage that kind of every day. I don't think any of that goes away in any model of school production. So um, I think part of this is that um, we've got to be geared up as administrators in the district. Uh, to make sure that we're on board and ready to go and implement all three of these any given time. I um, would echo what Superintendent Malone said, but I would just again add our eyes to be on the prize, how will we get the kids back in, when is all in safe, when is that going to happen? Um, things we've seen, but I think it's still it's a little of a plot, our eye to continue to do that. How do we do that? When do we do that? And how do we make it that we're not able to do that? Perhaps because of the experience, because the models are being prepared, but they all have to be really robust and done well. Wow. And, and so I think we all have that end insight where that is on the timeline. You know, it's, it's the reflection of that. Right? Positivity and optimism in it. That's what we're trying to get there. Thank you. That's a good Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chairman, uh, I apologize to interrupt, but we do have a caller on the line if you'd like to take that call. Sure, we'll take that call. Uh, this is James Davidson from 20 Long Meadow Road. Whenever you're ready, James. Hi, uh, uh, committee, I do apologize for calling in uh, so late. But thank you so much for accepting my question. Um, I am a um, uh, teacher in the town. Uh, just a quick question. The, the MTA and the TTA are all for students going back to school remotely. And I'm kind of uncertain and unsure why this information has not been made public today or uh, <clears throat> at any of the past meetings regarding this. I think it would just help with a lot of the challenges being faced with the uh, against the hybrid and the all-in model. But it seems to me that this information, I know you've been having the task force and you've been doing these surveys, but these two huge, um, <clears throat> these two big parties uh, are, are not, I don't think their their voices are being heard. Thank you. I can tell you, I can tell you James, that everyone in this room is, uh, aware of the MTA and the TTA's position. Um, they have made it publicly aware of myself, my colleagues via email. Um, they've made it clear during negotiations. They've made it clear uh, during some, I believe, I don't want to misquote uh, some of the meetings that they've had. So you'd have to ask them, but they've also made it clear with parents. So um, I, I just respectfully have to disagree that 
um, that information isn't out there publicly. But I do thank you for calling in. And Mr. Chairman, just to add to that, the uh, TTA, Tuxbury Teachers Association, has three members on the task force and have shared very specific information from the TTA uh, that originated from the MTA with the task force. They've been part of every task force meeting and shared information from the TTA and the MTA during the Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any additional questions for Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Collins. Mrs. Demos? Hi. Um, I just wanted to read something that I had prepared just because I had a lot of thoughts going through my brain, so I wanted to just make sure I was clear. Um, and I just want to say that as I sat researching data, reading emails, taking phone calls from community members, honoring my vote for school, I was driven by one word, and that word was safety. What is best? What is the best and the safest way for our students um, to get back to learning? This fall will be unlike any other school opening, and personally, I hope to never see one like this again. I believe the answer to this reopening plan is not a one-size-fits-all plan, as the state plan asks us to choose from. I believe the best interest for some of the students at grade levels is not the best interest for the other students. I wish that we could almost have a hybrid of the three plans. In my heart of hearts, I want to see the students learning and thriving in a safe learning environment again. This will look different for different students. We as a district need to be looking into a phased approach to school reopening, want to utilize the first 10 days allotted to us by the commissioner for professional development and committee purposes. This will allow, allow for a robust hybrid and remote model to be developed. It will allow us to be ready to teach and learn again on September 16th, however that may be. I want nothing more for the students to be in the building daily and making connections with their teachers, staff, peers. But given the current situation restrictions, I feel we need to be very careful at the time and reassess every two weeks to see whether or not it's safe for these students, teachers, and staff to return to the buildings implementing a detailed phase and hybrid model of teaching, beginning with our high needs population and kindergarten and first grade students who really struggle with the digital learning platform of remote learning. If we find the numbers are high and it's not safe to return, then we should be continuing to teach remotely, we'll taking into account the accountability of all stakeholders, and then continuing reassessing on a regular basis. My hope is that it'll tra trend downward and we'll be able to implement the hybrid model sooner versus later in full diligence. But I believe it's the best interest of all that we make sure that whatever plan we pick, we need to plan to start slowly and ease our way back in instead of having to do the opposite. I hope the community understands all the time and effort that went into making this decision and know that the social, emotional well being, as well as the physical well being of all the students, is at the heart of this decision. I, I just want them to hear the fact that these three plans to me are hard to pick from because I don't think it's a quick cookie cutter for all students. I think that to say that we are ready to go all hybrid is scary at this point. I think to say that we're all ready to stay all remote is also scary for some. We have some high need students that we need to get in the building sooner versus later, but we also need to be cognizant of the social, emotional, and physical well being of all the students. So I just wanted to make sure that we were, I was clear to the community that I had taken into account all of those factors that I wanted to Mrs. Demos, do you have any questions for Mr. Um, the superintendent or the assistant superintendent? No, I've asked all my questions. I, need to ask. uh, I would just like to uh, echo basically what everyone has said here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I think everyone knows that. Uh, I don't, you know, profess to be a teacher. Uh, I am someone that's, you know, grown up in this community. I think Tokesbury is a wonderful and awesome place. Um, I think times like today are very difficult. Um, I'm a math guy. I'm a simple math guy. And I can uh, already see that regardless of what path we've been on there, with three plans, uh, a large amount of this community um, isn't going to be satisfied or happy or whatever word we're going to choose. Um, I want the community to understand that um, there's a host of things that are going to contribute um, to my decision today. Obviously, that the health and safety of students and staff and people 
work here. Um, I weigh greatly and heavily um, student academics and outcomes that we all talk about. That I don't need to be a teacher in a classroom, but as a coach in a youth sports uh, team, you know, I get to see that every day. So um, the feasibility of being able to do stuff, um, the family needs, the impact, the infrastructure, um, as most Demo said, our most vulnerable students, um, things, routines, social and emotional well beings, uh, regression. We're never really going to know the uh, true academic and social regression of some of these kids. Um, financing, um, after school clubs and activities. Uh, all of this stuff um, weighs heavily on myself and I know my colleagues did and the people around us. Uh, so, um, as I said, you know, obviously, I don't think everyone's going to be um, happy. I'll be honest with you. I approach this like I approach most things. Um, I come in, I don't take a position and then find some information that supports my decision. In fact, if you asked me a couple months ago before we undertook this process, um, I have a different view today. I have moved on what um, I originally thought um, I was open to that process, um, and I just, you know, I can't reiterate enough that I hope, regardless of the decision today, that our community members and our teachers and our families and our students do the same. Um, but we, we got a great time. Uh, Mr. Wilson and, and I were somewhat joking earlier. I think he's been through a similar thing for people that have been around the community uh, with regards to, to the casino vote. Uh, you know, what happens today it's only going to be best for students if we re-energize and we focus and we all get together and do what's best for students. And I know, as I said earlier, uh, this committee is fully committed to doing that, not only for our students and our staff, uh, but our families as well. So uh, with that being said, what is the, uh, have a, what's the pleasure of the board at this time? Mr. Chair, I would just defer to speak to the other callers. Brian, do we have any other callers? We just have one coming through right now, Mr. Chairman. I can put them. Yep. This is this is Jeff. That means you, that you're on, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, you're on. Yeah. You're on. Okay. You can um, you can make a comment. Uh, yeah, my question's for uh, Keith. Just have one coming through right now, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, this, this is Hello, my my question's for Chairman Sullivan. Um, I'm. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you please, Hi, um, can you please my mute your TV? For Chairman Sullivan. Um, I've noticed that he's had his mask off almost the entire time he's been speaking, and I'm wondering yeah. how a child is going to keep their mask on for a full day when we're not, you, you guys aren't even able to do it for the entire meeting. Yeah. That's an honest question. We are, as I announced prior to the meeting, we are in compliance with CDC guidelines. A mask is not required. Um, I have simply been wearing a mask. Uh, it's more commutative. We're in a big room here. I want to make sure that people could hear me, and that's why. Okay, I, just, I think it's going to be very hard for a second grader to keep a mask on all day when, like us as adults, can't really do it. It just, it just struck me as odd that there was that we're looking at that, and that, that you know, during the meeting, we're not even able to do it. So I, I was just curious about that. Thank you very much. I don't disagree with you, Jeff. Thank you for calling. Make a motion. Take a vote on the school reopening plan for 2020-21 school year. With what direction or model? Uh, Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the school reopening plan. For Mr. All Chairman, just so you, I, I do believe the required vote for the middle to DESE is the committee.
determining which model the district will be open to. That's the specific element that we've done for DSC. We have to supply a plan, a complete plan that covers all models, but it's designed to highlight. Uh, the, granted, we, we've, had, we've had many conversations with this on DGC, and we just got a newer update today. And uh, the specific update from the commissioner was uh, a plan that, that uh, has all three models that highlights the model that the district will open in, a specific committee vote will be specific to the model of which the district will open. Okay. Yes, Mr. Wilson. So, so I just want to you know, I asked some questions earlier, but I didn't really comment on sort of my thoughts. Um, so I just want to say that I appreciate all the outreach. Talk to more parents and teachers from within the community in the last 24 hours that I've talked to in a long time. I would encourage the teachers to remain in contact and to continue to talk with us um, because I really did enjoy some of those conversations getting to understand some of their issues and concerns. I think those issues and concerns are valid. Uh, I think we all recognize that they have you know, good thoughts, issues, uh, things that were raised. I think parents on the same token have raised similar issues, or maybe on a different side of the issues. I don't think it's one size fits all for where people stand. Um, I know from my day to day, I've been, you know, I've been at work the entire time during this pandemic. At Verizon, we have continued to change what we do every day based on the changes that have come. And I think that as a school system, we're going to end up doing the same exact thing based on testing and results and transmission and, and really knowledge because there's a lot of people that will claim to be experts on what's going on. But the reality of the situation is that we're learning every day about uh, this virus and the pandemic and how to keep people safe. Um, so I don't want to put a stake in the ground suggesting that I know better than someone else. Um, but I do agree with what you set up, you know, when you said at the end of the day, we're going to make a decision based on what we believe is best for the kids um, and for uh, our community and for teachers uh, for everyone involved and, uh, i just believe that we will figure out how to pivot based on more guidance from the state and while i see value in all these plans um, i believe that understanding when we pivot what that what metrics are going to drive us to that pivot are going to be critically important and i think now after this vote that's when the real work begins because there's a tremendous amount of questions that people feel um, we didn't have the details for or we don't know about at this point. Um, we haven't gotten to that level of the plan yet. Uh, we were given a task in a very short time and uh, worked hard to come up with what made sense within the plans. And um, I think that People need to be a little bit patient, even though school is around the corner. And typically at this point, teachers have everything lined up for the first couple months of the school year. So I think we're understanding of all that. Um, and I just wanted to sort of get that out there and thank people for all their feedback and comments and just let them know that this is the time for that open dialogue to continue. Um, and regardless of the vote today, that's not the, you know, this isn't the end, this is the beginning. And hopefully we continue to talk and make decisions. So um, if you're ready to make a motion, I'll actually defer to you. Okay, I do have something to comment. Then I'll, I'll uh, defer to you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we do have another caller if you'd like to take that call. Okay, I believe it's a teacher. Uh, Hi, how's it going? This is Connor calling. I teach at the high school. Um, am I on? Yes, Connie. Yes. Hi, uh, this is Connor Connor. I call it the high school. Um, Keith, I just have a clarifying question because a lot of people aren't sure if they heard it right. Did you say masks were going to be required or were they not going to be required? No, no, masks. I believe if you listen to the presentation, um, yesterday masks are going to be required. 
Okay, thank you. People were just texting. Oh. I call in just to clarify that. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Right. Thank, you. Right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So a few thoughts I had after this came up. Um, so no one can argue that students learn best when they're inside of a classroom, when they're sitting directly in front of their teacher, in a circle, or on a mat with their fellow classmates and friends. The CDC notes that schools are an important part of the infrastructure of communities as they provide safe, supportive learning environments for students, employ teachers and other staff, enable parents, guardians, and caregivers to work. Schools will provide critical services to help to mitigate health disparities, such as school field programs, social, physical, behavioral, and mental health services. School closure disrupts the deliverable of these critical services to children and families and places additional economic and physiological stress on families, which can increase the risk for family conflict and violence. As some of you know, I come from a family of educators and somewhat understand the daily demands to keep children engaged. I hear the shared stories around the dinner table, and other gatherings, what it takes to keep these kids going, the highs and sometimes lows, and the challenges during the days. I understand that teachers want to get back into the classroom just as much as these children, but they need to feel safe doing it. If a teacher can't be comfortable in a classroom, how can a student feel comfortable in that very same setting? Of course, where do people get their best advice from these days? Not from actual people, of course. They get it from their computer, smartphone, or other devices. But most important, Google. When you type in best advice for teaching or how to be the best teacher, it comes with the basics. So over a plan for the day, takes notes, collaborate, be dedicated. But the first thing on every site is to make that very great first impression on your first day and smile. It's that first impression that sets the mood for the remainder of the year. Now I ask you, when the child's first, the child's new teacher, their first impression is going to be that smiling behind a mask. What impression does that really set? Now let's talk about mask wearing. Children be wearing a start wearing it around they leave their homes, board the bus, enter the school and in their classroom, looking at around two hours for their first break. I was part of a COVID-19 reopening team. We met regularly to review the ever-changing CDC mass guidelines. We're looking up to open during phase one. We opened at limit capacity. I hung around countless signs, knowing it was mask wearing was required by state law. Minority of kids and adults were able to make it through an hour in the park. They continuously fiddled with them, letting them slide down, simply remove them. So as was noted yesterday, part of their 10 days for their teachers' PD time be to train them and work with students on mask wearing. Is this something we truly need? Are we now asking teachers to add yet another item to the disciplinary rule? If John and Jane kid in their classroom won't wear their mask for more than X amount of time, do we really get sent down to the principal's office? Recess and other outdoor activities are going to be masks off, students staying six feet away from one another. This all being staff monitored. This is not practical. Never kids want to be congregating it towards one another. They play and run around with one another. Who doesn't like a good game of tag to get their energy taken out of? On the other side of it, who wants to be that teacher, that staff member, who's yelling, telling kids to get away from one another? Now, depending on the model, lunch is going to be served at student desks. Items are going to be delivered prepackaged. So walking through your day, from a student's perspective, you're looking at a day with a mask on, boarding a bus, placed on an assignment, assigned seat, Signed bus seat, alternating rows, kept away from other students, classroom set up at four facing desks, masks on that should only take off to eat for short breaks. Love to leave, leave when you see your fellow classmates or friends, when you only can stay six feet away from one another. Now, what does that all sound like? Not much, not much like a school or a classroom anymore. More like a sterile, I'll let you fill in the rest of the words there. It's not very warm or welcoming to a child. Now, you guys all know I'm kind of a pain in the rear. I'm data driven like everybody knows. I tend to look beyond what the minimal required rating is. I look to someone named Catherine Edwards, who is a pediatric infection Z specialist, who works with Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. She worked with National School System, who just did an opening for 86,000 students. 
She knew that the data in the outcome was scarce, and she found it very frustrating. She spent hours for data um, for younger kids who are less adept at spreading the virus than older ones. Whether the outbreaks followed reopening and found little bit addressed the risk of the contagion in schools. Now, gathering data for school trivial comes with layers of complexity beyond those of traditional pediatric research. Now, without this accurate data, there's no clear best strategy for opening schools. So schools around the world are inventing their own solutions. A Canadian school is limiting social groups for reassessing groups to just six, which requires them to distance themselves further with six feet away as well. Schools in Denmark have moved classes outside, also in nearby graveyards. China is now moving them to wearing you know, masks, which they're used to, and students can only remove their masks during lunchtime. Austria's tried the same approach, but abandoned a few weeks later, since they found there was little spread during school. But then in, in Jerusalem, they abandoned their mask policy during heat wave and fought a major outbreak in high school. Now here in Tuxbury, we've said we're, gonna, we're not gonna utilize outdoor space for security reasons, which is fine. Instead, we're gonna keep everybody inside. We also realized that we live in the Northeast, outside space can only be reliable for a few months out, outside of the school year. And then we fly back to Anthony Fauci, and he favors K-12 students for training school. But he also stressed the primary consideration in making the decisions to be based on the safety of students and staff. He said that students need the, psych the psychological and nutritional benefits of being inside the classroom. But he also noted that parents need to be dramatically, they need to dramatically modify their work schedule in order for this to happen. The primary consideration will always be the safety, the health, and the welfare of the children as well as the teachers and the secondary effects to spreading that to the parents of the other family members, he said. If done properly, it would not be a risk, but then again, you've got to be careful when you've got people coming in from the outside. Again, it is all these variables we've got going on. When we start with just Tuxbury students, we toss in grandparents, parents, weekend road trips, up upcoming beekeeping trips, family visits, it becomes a very interesting mix in this big blob group that she's got to deal with. The reason in person private schools work and colleges work is they're putting place this test, they quarantine their kids and they test again 14 days later. Students stay on campus, they're not allowed to leave, and there's no additional variables to work with. We just don't have this luxury of dealing, dealing with as a public school. That's why it illustrates why it's so frustrating with this virus. Virus. It's difficult to have, have a handle on what works and what doesn't and why. We seem to know that the spread of COVID is not as bad among young people, but at what age does the threat increase? That is where the adult aspect comes into play here in Tuxford. We have both young and seasoned teachers, aides, and other professionals here in all of our buildings. Again, this vote is for both the students, the teachers, and the staff alike. I appreciate all the community and profi professional outreach that I've received in the last moment. Additionally, I can't fathom what the new normal is, being the teaching in 2020, the year of the mass. On the record, I feel the state has done a great job with reopening in stages, stages, guidance, and now imposing fines for traveling, but it's quite unfair that each town needs to have their own independent reopening plans. This takes time away from everyone's primary jobs here in town, something the state should have tied directly in with the state's reopening plans. As a parent to a freshman and junior, I understand it is far easier for my family to maintain as such a remote start of violence. I understand the massive burden that my, my vote puts on parents at, young, at home with younger children and special needs, but recognize that the overall safety for all is still many unknowns and variables. We're beginning to see a bit of an uptick in cases here in Massachusetts, but there may be a blip or it could be the start of something. We just don't know. I like the time to be able to watch this data and see where it goes. I don't like the idea of starting on a person, but only having to shut it down in case the start arrives. This is disruptive to both students and the staff. I would much rather see stage reopening, much like they have, much like we've had in the entire community reopening at other stages. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Mr. Chair. Joe, Mr. Yeah, thank you. I just have a few comments as well. And I appreciate everything that Mr. Stadman said. It was very helpful and very informative. And I also appreciate everything that Mr. Wilson and Mrs. Nemo said. I agree with 90% of everything that they said. And I just have a few comments. 
we all in this room have said it repeatedly, and you have, Mr. Chairman, as well, that we're going to do the best, what's in the best interest of the entire community at large. Children, parents, teachers, uh, adult members, elderly members, staff, everyone. And with that, we're going to be guided by the science. And I don't think that anyone in this room disagrees that children can contract the virus and can, can transmit the virus. I think that's the latest data, and we don't dispute it. But what we also have to understand is that we were recently informed that Tuxbury only has six cases. There are only six active cases right now. And our positivity rate in this time is 0.59%. That's less than 1%. So there are only six active cases and we're less than, point, less than 1%. Uh, I do, I know parents, my kids are grown. I have close family members that are teachers. Not in such great, but some of them are in Massachusetts and members of the MTA. And I, I just before this meeting watched uh, Randy Weingartner on MSNBC, and she made comments about when we can reopen the schools. And she's the head of the American Federation of Teachers, 1.7 million members. She said that there were two primary considerations to take into account. Things could be different from district to district. The first one she said is we have to be guided by the community spread. How many cases do you have in your community? What's the positivity rate? She said under 1.7% was good. And her second viewpoint was, is the district adopting all the safe safeties uh, and safety measures that are appropriate and are recommended by the CDC and other uh, World Health Organizations? And we've done that. Our administration, Mr. Libby, Mr. Reagan, Superintendent Malone, uh, Mr. Gautier, have and our district leadership team have done an outstanding job, have covered, I think, every single base, gone through every single detail. Uh, we have social distancing in place. We can be six feet apart. We can wear masks. We can provide all the uh, PPE to the teachers and the staff as necessary. We're working hand in hand with our town board of health. We're getting the data on a daily basis if necessary. Now, our board of health is not just have data from Tuxbury, but has data from all the surrounding Merrimack Valley Town, which is also very low with the exceptional low, which might uh, be a little high. But they have it in place. We can bus the students safely. We can feed them safely. We have to look at that. If we're guided by the science, we're guided by what's in the best interest of everyone, then that leads me to come to the conclusion that it would be safe to have a hybrid home, that we could bring half of the students in for a period of time during the day. We can start with that, knowing full well that we're making that decision because we have to send one to the state. Today, August 6th, it's not going to start until September 16th. Six weeks going to go by, things could change dramatically. We could go to zero cases in such a We could go to 100 cases in such a way. make a difference. I know that our administrative team, as well as we are, our Board of Health, we monitor that on a regular basis, and that can cause everything to change. But right now, our situation looks pretty good right here in Tuxbury. It can change dramatically. No one wants to get the COVID virus. I have good friends that are my age, the mid 60s, that got it, and it was devastating, extremely debilitating, and I understand that. No one's taking it lightly. We want safety first. But on by the guidance that we have, we have low number of cases in time, we have very low positivity rate, we have all the necessary safeguards in place. I think the hybrid model right now, we should try to start with that. If things change dramatically, then we can adjust to it. Six weeks to do that. So I will make a motion that we send the uh, hybrid model to the state as I prefer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I have a motion by Mr. Collins to approve the pre model plan with the pre entering to include the hybrid model. Do I have a second? I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second to approve the pre model plan and focus on the hybrid as its starting reopening model for the 2020 2021 school year. Mr. Wilson, how do you vote? Vote aye. Mr. Stadman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Cutlass, how do you vote? Aye. Mrs. Demos, how do you vote? Okay. The chair votes aye as well. It's a 3 2 vote. The motion carries. The district will continue to develop the three plans for reopening. Our focus will be sent as the step two part of the desk process to start our reopening model for the 2020 2021 
in the hybrid model. Thank you all, committee members. Mr. Collins? Um, I don't believe we have any further business. We do not. I would make a motion to adjourn. Okay, I have a motion to adjourn. Um, actually, before we do, I would just like to inform the public the next school committee meeting is Wednesday, August 19th. Um, please note the time. I think it's listed incorrectly on the Tuxbury uh, and the town website. So I'll look into that in the next day or two and make sure we get it up there. Um, but for sure, our next school committee meeting will be August 19th, Wednesday. And we are hopeful that that will be hopefully open to the public. I have a motion on the table to adjourn. Second. A motion and a second to adjourn this evening. Mr. Stabman, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Douglas? Aye. Mr. Demos? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Thank you very much and thank you to the public for your participation.